Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And now to Hebrews chapter 4, a couple verses from there. Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. In verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. And now from Matthew chapter 11, the words of Jesus paraphrased by Eugene Peterson in the message. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, that was pretty good, guys. All right, grab a seat. Labor Day. And on Labor Day, we're actually beginning our very first session in Future Church, talking about Sabbath and rest. Let me pray for us one more time. Father, as a newly forming community of faith, we have such a need to never be caught up in the chaos of our own souls and the chaos of culture. More than ever, the Christian community, disciples of Jesus, need to operate in the world as a non-anxious presence, as a people of peace, peacemakers, peace providers, peace preachers. And only from a place of rest and a place of deep solace of soul will we be able to do the activity you've called us to. Only from a place of silence will we be able to speak forth the words of your will into this world and be heard. Spirit of God, come. And even now, in this present moment, if even but for 30 minutes, settle these souls into the eternal rest that Jesus of Nazareth has provided by his life, by his death, by his resurrection. Spirit of God, come and unify us around rhythms of grace and mercy. Spirit of God, come and animate us to be a people not of anxiety and rush, frenetic pacing, but a people of steadiness, spiritual confidence, a people of repose. And may we be a people who invite this war-torn and ragged world into the community of Jesus to be at rest with each other as one. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, today is the first day, the first session. Last week, we committed our entire Sunday to nothing but prayer in preparation for this new series that we've entitled Future Church. We're doing this series alongside a community, a family of churches, Park Hill Church over in Point Loma, Evan and the guys, our sending church, as well as Benji and the crew up in Encinitas at Light Church. As well, this past week, we met with about 80 different churches from all across the nation we are all coming together, coalescing as a community of newly forming churches to seek God's will and his way for the church in this next generation. And so collabor collaboratively, many of us are doing this particular series together, sharing notes, cutting and pasting each other's ideas, and then presenting them to our communities in the hopes that what will come from these seeds is eventually a whole coalition of churches living by one rule of life. We talked about that two weeks ago. Go back to the podcast united in belief and behavior. So over the next eight Sundays, we are going to collectively be looking at eight unique 
challenges that we face in this cultural moment as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, eight, of course, is not exhaustive. We, the church, face almost an innumerable amount of challenges as this culture moves forward without Jesus at the center at all. But each week, we feel like these eight particular challenges need to be highlighted. And from those eight challenges, we're going to be presenting to you a particular practice, an actual embodied practice that will counterform the way that culture is trying to form us. We want to live into and abide in the practices of Jesus. And what we want to abide by is an alternate, an alternate vision for human flourishing. So each week, a challenge and then a practice that provides an alternate vision for the way that humans should live, could live, and will live when the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Our first session this morning is entitled, A Community of Rest in a Culture of Exhaustion. I will confess to you, given all the melee, given all the chaos of recent, over these last two years, I found myself asking my family this last week, doesn't it seem somewhat trite, a little bit trivial, to be talking about rest on a Sunday morning in light of everything that's happening around us? And in pondering that further with my family and in actually meditating on it and praying on it, I can't think of anything more important than for the people of God in this moment to be a people of peace. And the only way that we will be a people who preach the truth of the gospel is to be a people who come from rest. And so we begin our sessions from a place of prayer and a place of rest. The challenge that we face in the church in this cultural moment is a low-grade fatigue, if not full-on burned-out exhaustion. And the practice that is going to alleviate that exhaustion is rest, but not just any kind of rest, Sabbath rest. How many of you are familiar with the term Sabbath, just by a show of hands? Good. So most of us as good Protestants, we've been reading our Bibles. We know the word Sabbath, but we don't actually know how to engage with Sabbath. For those of you that are actually unfamiliar with the idea, we follow Pete Scazzaro very closely. He's a mentor through his books to all of our churches, and his definition of Christian Sabbath is really spot on. He says, Sabbath is a 24-hour period that entails four specific qualities, stopping, resting, delighting, and contemplating God. Those four, for those of you that are taking notes, it may come up on the screens for you, it may not. Sabbath is a 24-hour period that entails four specific qualities. These four specific qualities are stopping, resting, delighting, and contemplating God. Let me just flesh those out for you. Stopping. 24-hour period of time where you literally cease from all work. Not only physical work, but even mental work. Sabbath is the Hebrew word Shabbat. It literally translates cease. And so Christian Sabbath, the practice of Sabbath, is once a week there is an intentional 24-hour period for my family. It's from about 5 o'clock on Friday evening until about 5 o'clock on Saturday evening where everything stops. Work stops. Mental effort stops. You just kind of enter into this doing nothing phase for 24 hours out of every single week. Number two, Scazzaro would say, as important to a true Sabbath, ceasing from work is an intentional resting. The day is actually committed to restorative activities like naps. Yesterday, I slept for three hours on my couch. Well done. I nailed Sabbath. It was absolutely amazing. See how good it is to be a Christian? You get applauded for taking a three-hour nap. That's amazing. Slow walks, eating good food, hanging out with friends that you delight in and they delight in you. This is part of resting on this 24-hour period. Number three, delighting. The day is designed by God for us as his humans to just delight in being humans. And so on these slow walks, it's important that we take in all of the amazing things that God would have us to delight in. I love going on slow Sabbath walks with my wife because she literally likes to stop and smell every flower along the way. Mm, that was a good one. 15 meters later. Oh, that was a good one. Just taking it all in. Just delighting. Nowhere to go fast, slowly pacing through life, delighting. And then number four, maybe most importantly, Shabbat. Cease from work. 
Rest, delight, contemplate. Our culture has confused rest with numbing out and distraction. Shabbat is not the day to binge watch Netflix all day. Now, let me caveat that. There are intentional moments in time, especially if you have kids that are little. It's wonderful to just say, we're going to watch the entire Lord of the Rings series extended version today. And you start at 5 in the morning when the kids wake up, and you don't go to bed till like 10 o'clock that night, and you're just like a pile of drool with popcorn hanging on your chest, whatever. That's awesome. But only once in a while, because the design of Sabbath is to contemplate, that is to consider to look long at what God is doing, who God is, who we are in him. Sabbath is a day to see God seeing us, to hear God hearing us, to live into the God that has breathed life into us. Cease, rest, delight, contemplate, 24-hour period, once a week, non-negotiable. Why is the practice of Sabbath itself so important to the Christian community in this generation? Well, we're going to spend the rest of our time answering that very question. I want to argue for you and propose to you that Sabbath may be one of the most important practices you can engage in in this generation of the church for your well-being and for the well-being of the church. I have been dabbling in the health and fitness kind of human performance, human optimization world for the better part of a decade now. Reading, messing around, coaching, whatever. And there has literally been a paradigm shift in the way that coaches and researchers and sports psychologists understand the process of actually getting the human body as healthy and as fit and as optimal as possible. Back in the day, 20 years ago, when I was a high school football and track athlete, The school of thought generally was push the body as far as it can possibly go and then push it further and then do that same thing over and over again as often as possible. And this is why even at the age of 18, me and my buddies were plagued with a continual series of irritating injuries and like a low-key hatred for our coaches. (laughs) Now, with the advancement of technology and research, we now clearly know that time out of the gym, time off the field is just as important, some might argue, even more important than the time spent training. The human body, which is a miracle of biology, it grows and it heals and it only gets stronger when it is at rest. We're not getting faster and stronger when we are running and lifting. We are breaking things down. It is in rest when things begin to build back up. The human brain, the human brain does most of its processing, its filing, its repairing, and its planning while we are unconscious in our sleep. Therefore, today's elite level coaches, they actually demand of their athletes regimented schedules of downtime supplemented by nutrition and naps and reparative therapies and meditation and oftentimes just good old plain times with friends, hanging out. Now, the great church planter Paul, the apostle, picked up on the image of athletes to describe the necessary training regiments for healthy human flourishing not only in this life but in the life to come. He would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, Don't you know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Followers of Jesus, ours is a crown that Paul says will last forever. That's what we're pursuing In these bodies, we are pursuing an eternal reward that requires regimented, strategic planning and preparation to actually make it to the finish line. We are, as we say at Neighbors often, embodied souls. Christian theology does not divorce spirit and soul from physicality. Here's a big word for you. We are not bifurcated beings. Bifurcated. What a great word. We aren't souls that are just trapped in our flesh. We are actually enfleshed spirit. Therefore, as our bodies go physically, so go our souls and our spirits. As our souls and our spirits go metaphysically, so go our bodies and our emotions and our minds. We are holistic beings. They are all intricately intertwined with one another. Our physical, mental, 
emotional and spiritual beings, the whole of our being, requires regimented times of deep rest to get this crown that will last forever. And yet, I can almost guarantee you, if I'm to ask any one of you, all you kids that are back in school now, all of you guys that are going to work tomorrow morning, how are you doing? The first word is going to be, I'm so busy. And the second one's going to be, I'm tired. I'm so tired. I'm just tired. Are you tired this morning? Raise your hand if you're tired this morning. Okay. <laughs> Sabbath, Sabbath resists this. The intentional practice of Sabbath, a weekly rhythm of 24 hours, resists this low-grade fatigue slash exhaustion that we are all being drowned in. Sabbath is an act of resistance against the cultural tides of exhaustion. Track with me now. Constant access to information, incessant technological distraction, civil upheaval, and what I would say, false notions. There are false notions of what will create the good life for us. It is these things that are wrecking us. Just 10 years ago, there was a series of studies that came out detailing the nature of extreme work hours. The researchers called themselves the Hidden Brain Drain Task Force. And they found that even a 60-hour work week was practically considered part-time. 62% of high-earning individuals work more than 50 hours a week. 35% worked more than 60 hours a week, and at the time, 10% worked more than an 80-hour week. A decade later, there are multitudes of workplace cultures that now consider the 80-hour work week a badge of honor. What we have done is we have traded the core, healthy, human, restorative, growing activities like time together, time for rest, time for hobbies, time for exploration of nature. We have traded that for time for making money and climbing the social hierarchy. Our society calls exhausted people that have a lot of money and no time rich and successful. While those that have a lot of time but not a lot of money, we call them poor. Sabbath practice says, I'm going to resist this. An intentional 24-hour period of time says, I'm not going to be a production machine. I'm not going to be driven up the hierarchical social ladder by the material wealth that I can gain by simply putting in more hours for something that's going to rob my soul of what true richness is. Sabbath resists and says that there is a richness to life that is not based on what this world says true riches are. And it is the pursuit of treasures that will never fade, that no moth can destroy, that no rust can ebb away at. Sabbath lives into that reality in the context of rest and ceasing and celebration and contemplation and delight and loving one another well as we live our lives for what is truly right and good in this world. Number two, Sabbath restores an intentional 24-hour period of time is designed by God to restore the fullness of your humanness. This is going to be a long point. I really want you guys to track with me as closely as you can. Sabbath restores our souls. Cue up Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He restores my soul. If you are fatigued, anxious, depressed, broken, uncertain, Future casting constantly can't get the mind to slow down. Sabbath may be the key. It may be the secret sauce that your soul is longing for. Let's talk about this here for just a moment. The events of the last two years have put all of our systems on a constant state of overdrive. God actually made these brains. They are danger processing machines. That's what the human brain is in so many ways. And this is why whenever we see a tiger whether out in the wild or at the zoo or even on TV, the deep unconscious parts of our brain, the minute we see the tiger, a complex system of unconscious mechanisms puts all of our biology on high alert, readying us for freezing or fleeing or fighting. And while these brains are miraculous and terribly, terribly sophisticated, the human brain is still kind of dumb. In other words, it can't differentiate a real tiger from a TV tiger. Now, thankfully, we have something called the cerebral frontal cortex that kicks in. It's like a break on the inner parts of our brain, the amygdala and the limbic system that, that does all that unconscious stuff. So we're able to say with our prefrontal cortex, oh, that's a TV tiger, chill out. But we've already gone through this unconscious process of there's a tiger, whoa, danger. 
What happens to us in the cultural environments that we live in, in the West now, is this. We actually interpret that kind of off tone of voice in our boss. Was that a tiger? The lack of likes on our Instagram selfies. Ooh, is, that, is that a tiger? The political and the civil rage filling our social media platforms. The brain is like, that's a tiger. And the constant threats of new variants and the vaccines not working. These and a thousand other things are tigers chasing us from sunrise to sunset with endless energy and invisible teeth. Now, this constant physical fatigue, this mental raggedness of mind, this fragility of emotional capacity and exhaustion of soul, understand this is actually a malformation of what it means to be fully human. Let me just say that again. This low-grade constant physical fatigue, the mental raggedness of mind that so many of us are wrestling with even right now just to stay focused in a 45-minute sermon, the fragility of emotional capacity that so many of us are wrestling with, not in a condemning way, the levels of anxiety, the levels of depression in our current social moment, this fragility of emotional capacity and this exhaustion of soul, this burnout, these are all malformations of how God intends us actually to live as his human people. Our humanness is diminished by this constant exhaustion. God made us, and this is kind of cheesy, but it, it hits. God made us humans being before we were ever humans doing. We are just humans being, first and foremost, in the biblical record before we are humans doing. Let's get into the book of Genesis for just a moment. In Genesis... Adam's first experience, as he came awake in consciousness, he became aware of his awareness in those first moments. His very first day of living and being aware was not a day to go and do and cultivate and make industry and make art. It was an immersion into God's rest. Follow with me. The Hebrew Bible's account of creation is not a scientific account of creation. We're just going to say that up front here at Neighbors. It is a theological narrative using Hebrew metaphor and poem. Yes, it's telling of creation, but it's framing it in this theological pattern, emphasizing six days on, one day off, in light of how God wants to order the universe. Six days of work and a seventh day of rest is a pattern that is ingrained in the universe for all of time. And so the Hebrew sages tell us that in six days, God made all that was. And at the end of that six days, he capped it off with us, Imago Dei, image bearers, Adama and Heva. Dirt and source of life, Adam and Eve. And the next day, after capping it off with Adam and Eve, was a day of holy rest. We read this already, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Adam and Eve were created to be in relationship with God and rest. Hear this. Adam and Eve, humans, were created to be in intimate relationship with God, and the foundation of that relationship wasn't what they would do for God or in obedience to God. It was an immersion into God's rest. Old Testament scholar Michael Morales he argues that we can't fully grasp the significance of who we are as humans created on the sixth day if we don't see it in light of the seventh day of rest. This is an extensive quote, but track with it, please. The extensive description of humanity's creation on the sixth day is primarily for the sake of understanding the prospect of communion with God on the seventh day. As the crown of creation, humanity is made in the image and likeness of God the Creator. No doubt this status entitles Adam, that is humanity, male and female, to rule and subdue the rest of creation. Now listen, but the primary blessing of being created in God's image is in order to have fellowship with the creator in a way that other creatures cannot. And so the seventh day of holy rest is entirely about the gift of relationship with God. Now, we know the rest of the story. By the time we get to chapter 3 in the book of Genesis, 
Adam and Eve are no longer living in a state of rest in their relationship with God. They've been deceived by the serpent, and sin has entered the world. Therefore, we see that they came to believe a lie. They believed the lie that they could become God themselves. And when they believed that lie, their bodies and souls were cast from that place of constant repose and rest into this place of drivenness and fear and shame. They were enslaved by Satan and by sin. And ever since that moment, the sages of Genesis tell us, we humans have been overcompensating, striving, pursuing, and working ourselves to the bone, all in an attempt. If we really go deep in why we're trying to climb the social hierarchy, why we're trying to make as much money as possible, why we can't stop being distracted with trying to get likes on wherever we are at, if we do all of that, it is all a hard work effort to cover our shame, to give us a sense of acceptance, and to once again find unconditional love, even though we're conditionally laboring ourselves to death for it. Now, God did not leave humans in this state of exhaustion. He loves us. So we leap forward millennia in the story, and God embodied himself in Jesus. Holy Father and Son and Spirit, Trinity, God embodied himself in flesh to restore you and I, the lost Adams and Eves of his creation, back to the garden. St. Paul would call Jesus the new Adam, the right and true and perfect Adam, because Jesus would live his life as an embodied human, perfectly at rest in his Father's love every millisecond. Jesus lived out of a relationship with his Father that was perfectly at rest, and he did that as our representative, as our champion. He did for us what we couldn't do, and then he died our exhausted death as our substitute on the cross. The author of Hebrews He picks up on this, and Hebrews is an extremely dense book. It takes a lot of work to get your way through Hebrews and grasp what he's getting at. But in summary, there's these sections where the author of Hebrews is looking at Jesus' life and looking at Jesus' death, and he's looking at Jesus' resurrection, and he's saying to his communities, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and our being metaphysically or miraculously in the new Adam, this is the means of eternal rest restored to humanity. Not just a day off, but a rest that sets your souls at repose, restores you to that garden relationship with your Father that all happens by faith in Jesus. And the author of Hebrews took this very seriously. He warned his communities of the absolute necessity of resting in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us be found to have fallen short of it. What a great warning. Be careful that you're not resting in Jesus enough. (laughs) That sounds really good. Jesus would go on, and in his ministry, he actually called us to rest in this way. Verse 11, or chapter 11 of Matthew 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to read this again from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. It may feel odd, but I'd invite you to just close your eyes and listen to these words one more time from Jesus' mouth to us. And let him speak to you. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Eyes open. Did you catch that? Jesus would just say, to rest, walk with me, and work with me, and watch how I do it. It's a summary of our mission and vision statement here at Neighbors. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. Do what Jesus did. Rest in the exact same way that Jesus did. And so Jesus is now our restoring Sabbath, this metaphysical, eternal rest that we are called to live into as our foundation. And we must understand that the people of God in Jesus, practicing Jesus' rest, we rest very differently than the world around us. This is such a key idea. Follow closely. 
Somebody turned me on to an Eastern Orthodox scholar whose name I cannot pronounce to save my life. Erasmo Leva Merikakis, close enough. He had this little work entitled The Way of the Disciple. It's a tremendous, short, little, easy read, but you got to just savor it. The Way of the Disciple. And Erasmus, he, he comments on this idea of coming to Jesus and entering into his rest. Let me read this lengthy quote for us. It'll be up on the screens. He says, true, Jesus gives us rest. But we must be clear that such rest is totally different it is totally different from just resting up in order to get back to the daily toils of life. It is different, too, from recreation or distraction or vacationing, all of which are ordered to getting back to the serious part of life. It seems to me that this rest for our souls is intended by Jesus to be a real and genuine state of life. The natural condition in which a child of God habitually exists and not just a passing phase of recovery. It is a deep condition of soul that is quite compatible with all the ordinary activities and efforts of human life. The one who truly becomes God's child, like Jesus, enjoys such rest as the very element of existence in which he swims. How nice does that sound? And so what Erasmus is saying, and I believe what the New Testament is saying, is that like Adam before the fall, but like Jesus, the new Adam after the fall, we, the spirit-filled body of Jesus, we are invited into and to live out of a new restored garden rest as the very element of existence in which we swim through the chaos that is this modern cultural moment. That is very different than the way that our friends and neighbors are resting right now. So think of it this way, just to really drive this point home. We're in a Navy town. I think this illustration will land. We tend to live our lives like fighter jets, right? Fighter jets are high-octane performance machines. They literally can fly, some of them, at three times the speed of sound. And so we wake up on Monday morning and we go Mach 3 through our life. Speed and intensity. We're war machines in battle. And then it's time to rest up. So the fighter jet approaches the aircraft carrier. It drops a hook out the back end of its tail, and there are these massive cables on these aircraft carriers. As it approaches the deck, it's dropped its speed at this point from Mach whatever down to 150 miles an hour, and it hits the deck, and the hook catches it, and everything goes and, 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 and the thing that was once going Mach 3 is now stopped violently, and now it's time to rest. It's a quick time of maintenance. It's a quick time of getting everything restored on the plane. Pilot goes in, gets some food. And then what happens is they put that plane back on that aircraft carrier. They get it into these massive, sophisticated catapults. And in the span of about half a second to two seconds, that plane that was at quote-unquote rest is launched off the end of that aircraft carrier at 165 miles an hour to go back to Mach 3 instantly. Does that sound familiar to any of us? Monday rolls around and we are catapulted into our week where we move at Mach 3 through the entire week until suddenly we violently stop Friday night, crash, sleep, do whatever we need, distract through Saturday to get back up and head out through the weekend, Monday morning, back. This is the way that most of us are resting. But Christian rest, according to the New Testament and according to Jesus, is not like violently stopping and then catapulting again. Christian rest is like learning how to become the aircraft carrier. <laughs> As we follow Jesus, we learn how to become a little more steady, a little more constant, a little more slow-paced. Again, this Eastern Orthodox scholar, Mary Caucus, he goes on to say this. This rest that we're talking about, it is not laziness or a restoration of energy in order to get back to the serious work. This rest is an end in itself. It is a way of life rooted in the relationship to God as our Father. Such rest is utter trust actually lived out moment by moment. But because it calls for the asceticism, that's the letting go of or the denial of, it calls for the asceticism of continual surrender. It has been called le, the laboriosa quies. That's not a Harry Potter curse, by the way. <laughs> the laboriosa quies, the rest that requires effort. The rest that requires effort. Friends, this is where we're going to land our planes. No, this is where we're going to get, no, this is where we're going to be the aircraft carrier. Just floating through receiving this. The rest that resists and restores, friends, that is hard work. That is hard work. 
of all the embodied practices of Christianity, prayer, fasting, silent solitude, scripture reading, you name it, I would propose to you, I think my wife would agree with this, of all of the practices that our family has engaged with over the last 20 years, hands down, the most important for our family and for the churches that we've led have been the institution of the practice of embodied Sabbath. And it has also been one of the most difficult to maintain, especially at the beginning. When I first began, and even up until just a few years ago, I thought of Sabbath like a fighter jet. Just fly through my week, violently stop on Friday night, <gasps> breathe, sleep, cry, distract, catapult back out into life. And yet, after decades now, approaching over 20 years of practicing every Friday into Saturday, this intentional ceasing, resting, delighting, and contemplating, Something has shifted in me, and Sabbath is no longer the thing that I'm just trying to collapse onto and then be catapulted back out in my life. Sabbath is the foundation of my week. It's the first day of my week, just like Adam. Adam became awake, and the very first day of his life was a day of rest. And so Sabbath, for me, has become this embodied way of beginning my week. And so I, of late, especially this last year, have so enjoyed Awakening on my Sundays, we're going to go just a little bit longer this morning because I want you guys to have this practice. Awakening on my Saturday with what I'm just calling Adam's prayer. I literally wake up on Saturday morning and go, this is what it's like to be aware. And imagine what it was like for Adam. And just pretend like I'm Adam, coming awake for the very first time. Nothing to do, nothing to be, nothing to, no one to impress. Just me there, aware of my awareness, aware that God has breathed life into me. And that sets the tone for the rest of my Sabbath day. Just quiet. And then I spend the day continually checking in, trying to train the mind to get off the runaway train that is my whatever this thing is up here. Whatever this thing is, you don't want to be in there very long. And Sabbath is the day to just be like, that's a lot of crazy thoughts. Great. Let's go smell the flowers. That takes a lot of hard work to not get on the crazy train that is Dan's brain. Sabbath is a day to lay on the couch. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday some, we were talking with a neighbor. He's like, hey, man, you going to work out today? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do some deadlifts. And I went in and I laid down on the couch. And the next thing I know, it's three hours later. I'm like, <laughs> Sabbath is a day to be like, if your body needs to sleep, then sleep. But it takes hard work because I felt this pressure. I had to resist the, the need to impress and to do and to make something happen with my life by going out to the gym with my neighbor. Sabbath is hard work, you guys, because it is rest that encompasses everything and resists everything that is pushing us away from God. It is this laboriosa quies, this rest that requires effort. And we all need to be kind with ourselves and gentle with ourselves because we've all been living like fighter jets. And fighter jets carry a ton of momentum. And so we learn through the practice of Sabbath what it actually feels like to be actually still to actually just let the thoughts go and be what they are, to just practice the belief that God will take care of whatever needs to be taken care of tomorrow. He's actually already there doing that. We have to practice the belief that our guilt and our shame all throughout Sabbath day has been covered in Jesus. What we've done wrong has been made right by Jesus. Where we've been wounded has been healed by Jesus. Where we've wounded is being healed by Jesus. And Shabbat is ceasing from worry and strain and strife and guilt and shame in an embodied way. And it takes a ton of effort and a ton of discipline. And I can hear the 8 million excuses that are being written out right now in all of our minds as to why a 24-hour period is just too long and it's not possible. I think these are lies. I think these might have been some of the starting lies in the garden. Did God really say, did God really say he wants you to delight and rest and cease for 24 hours? We have to resist, friends. We have to be restored by the power of Jesus. 
and the grace of the gospel that tells us we are accepted and loved not by what we do. And it is from that place we leave Sabbath. Like even right now, I'm still trying to like tune in with my body and bear fruit. Right now, I'm trying to fulfill my calling of what I've been told to do by my Father, which is go forth and multiply and cultivate and prepare and teach and do all the things that I've been personally called to do, but not from a place of anxiety. And I hope everybody accepts this. And I hope I don't offend anybody. I hope people show up. Yesterday, it was all day. Just no, my Father is already going before our community, therefore in my body right now, shalom, peace. And it's laboriosa quies. This requires tons of effort to carry Sabbath rest through your week. This is why the author of Hebrews used really intense language. We're almost done. Chapter, or chapter 4, verse 11 of Hebrews. He said, strive to enter that rest. Strive is like a, is like a I think it's a weak English translation. Here's my own translation. An expanded translation of Hebrews 4.11 would read like this. With intense effort and focused motivation, make every effort with urgency to enter this rest. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. In the coming years, let's land the plane and come to communion. And gals, you guys can come back up and we'll sing. In the coming years, we want to let Sabbath become a rule of life around which all of us are kind of setting our rhythms. Now, some of us won't be able to have the Friday-Saturday rhythm. That's totally fine. The commission, the call, the challenge is for you to say, where can I set aside 24 hours of my life to practice Shabbat, to cease, to rest, to delight, to contemplate, and let that become the foundation of my relationship with God, with this world, with other humans. I recognize that this is just a big 50,000-foot overview of Sabbath. We've been talking about Sabbath from the very beginning of Neighbors, and we intend to continue to talk about it until all of us are well into our graves. We intend to hand on to the generations of the church after us this rhythmic Sabbath practice. Did you guys know that sociologists would say one of the primary reasons the Jewish people have kept their Jewish identity through the eons, while all other tribal markers and tongues have lost their heritage, their tradition, their sense of culture, is because the Jews have Sabbath. When my wife and I were living out on the east side over there in college area, there's a synagogue over there, a Jewish synagogue. And every Friday evening, you'd see these cute little Jewish families with tassels. They're all Hasidics. They're, they're Orthodox. So they're cute little top hats. The dudes would be wearing their top hats with their curls. And the women, and they would all be walking with their families beginning their Shabbat evening walk before they would go home and light the candles and sing Shabbat songs. So what we're going to do is this week, I know this is going to take a lot of follow-up. We're going to be teaching on this for the rest of the life of our church, salting our rhythms with this Sabbath practice. But then this week, myself and Shua and Alexis and maybe some others, we're gonna do. We're gonna talk with people in our church that are practicing Sabbath and relay their information to you, talking about what does it feel like. How do you Sabbath as a single? What do you do if you're working three part-time jobs and you're a student right now with full-time load? There are so many complicating pressures to practicing Sabbath. And we want to talk about those earnestly and honestly. Sabbath, Jesus would say, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And what he was saying is, this is a gift to you. It's a gift to you to receive from your Father to live in relationship with him. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to remember. Communion is a time of remembering what it cost God to set us back at rest. Jesus Christ embodied God in the flesh, had to come and do what we couldn't do. He had to live in union with his father because we were separated. And when he died, our death, he died utterly exhausted. Like he died the ultimate exhaustion so that you and I wouldn't have to. And then he rose from the grave three days later. And somehow, in some mysterious way, when we say, Jesus, I obey you, I will follow you. I make you my king. You're the, you're the authority of my life. Supernaturally, the Holy Spirit, God himself, indwells you. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you, and we are all one in Christ. And in that mystery, all that Jesus did in his perfections in this life, the Father looks at you and says, well done, perfect. Doesn't that set your heart at ease? You're perfect. Perfect. 
and all the wrongs and all the woundings and all the mishaps and all the missteps and all the mistakes, Jesus absorbed all that. All of that, he went into utter ultimate exhaustion in death on the cross so that we would be in him, dying in him, all that old part of us. And when Jesus resurrected from the grave, we're told that we, we resurrect in him. A community of new Adama and Eva. New dirt filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed life into the church. New Eva, new source of life, Adam and Eve. A whole community of new Adams and Eves restored into this garden rest. And so communion takes us into this place of remembering what it cost Jesus and repenting of our striving and repenting, turning from our our constant go, go, go. Let communion be a time for you this morning to, to commit to covenant with your father saying, Father, I want to practice this. I want to resist the cultural exhaustion and I want my soul to be restored in Jesus. Father, as we now seek to sing to you and pray and receive communion, I pray that there would be a softness and a gentleness in this room in each soul that even as we're praying, they would feel the weight of their body against their chair and that their soul would surrender. Tomorrow is going to take care of itself. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. May they labor to enter the rest that you promise us to give to us. May we by faith surrender to our, our lives that, where we think we have to control the universe. You've done what needs to be done. And Father, you know what we need before we even ask. And so we rest in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.